Canto 2. There was a time in my demented youth when somehow I suspected that the truth about survival after death was known. To every human being, I alone knew nothing. And a great conspiracy of books and people hid the truth from me. There was a day when I began to doubt man's sanity. How could he live without knowing for sure what dawn, what death, what doom? Awaited consciousness beyond the tomb. And finally there was a sleepless night when I decided to explore and fight the foul, the inadmissible abyss, devoting all my twisted life to this one task. Today I'm 61. Wax wings are berry picking. A cicada sing. The little scissors I am holding are a dazzling synthesis of sun and star. I stand before the window and I pair my fingernails. And vaguely I'm aware of certain flinching likenesses. The thumb our grocer's son, the index lean and glum. College astronomer, star over blue. The middle fellow, a tall priest I knew. The feminine fourth finger and old flirt, a little pinky clinging to her skirt. And I make mouths as I snip off the thin strips of what Aunt Ma used to call scarf skin. Maud's shade was eighty when a sudden hush fell on her life. We saw the angry flush and torsion of paralysis assail her noble cheek. We moved her to Pinedale, famed for its sanitarium. There she'd sit in the last sun and watch the fly that lit upon her dress and then upon her wrist. Her mind kept fading in the growing mist. She still could speak. She paused and and found what seemed at first a service of bow sound. But from adjacent cells, impostors took the place of words she needed, and her luck spelt imploration as she sought in vain to reason with the monsters in her brain. What moment in the gradual decay does resurrection choose? What year? What day? Who has a stopwatch? Who rewinds the tape? Are some less lucky? Or do all escape? A syllogism. Other men die. But I am not another. Therefore, I'll not die. Space is a swarming in the eye, and time a singing in the ear. In this hive, I'm locked up. Yet if prior to life we had been able to imagine life, what mad, impossible, unutterably weird, wonderful nonsense it might have appeared. So 
So why join in the vulgar laughter? Why scorn a hereafter none can verify? The Turks delight the future liars of talks with Socrates and Proust in Cyprus walks. The seraph with his six flamingo wings and Flemish hells with porcupines and things. Isn't that we dream too wild a dream? And the trouble is we do not make it seem sufficiently unlikely. For the most, we can't think of is a domestic god. How ludicrous these efforts to translate into one's private tongue a public fate. Instead of poetry divinely terse, disjointed notes, insomnia's mean verse. Life is a message scribbled in the dark. Anonymous, espied on a pine's bark, as we were walking home the day she died. An empty emerald case, squat and frog-eyed, hugging the trunk, and its companion piece, a gum-logged ant. That Englishman and niece. Proud and happy linguist. Je l'ai les pauvres cigars. Meaning that he fed the poor cigar. La Fontaine was wrong. Dead is the mandible, alive the saw. And so I pair my nails and muse and hear the earth steps upstairs and all is right, my dear. So throughout our high school days I knew your loveliness but fell in love with you. During an outing of the senior class to New Wide Falls, we lunched on damp grass. Our teacher of geology discussed the cataract. Its roar and rainbow dust made the tame park romantic. I reclined in April's haze immediately behind your slender back and watched your neat small head bend to one side. One palm with fingers spread between a star of trillium and a stone pressed down the turf. A little flange bone kept twitching. Then you turned and offered me a thimble full of bright metallic tea. Your profile has not changed. The glistening teeth, biting the careful lip. The shade beneath the eye from the long lashes. The peach down rimming the cheekbone. The dark, silky brown of hair brushed up from the temple and from the neck. The very naked neck. The Persian shape of nose and eyebrow. You have kept it all. And on still nights, we hear the waterfall. Come and be worshipped. Come and be caressed. My dark Vanessa. Crimson barred my blast. My admirable butterfly, explain. How could you in the gloam of lilac lane have let uncouth hysterical John Shade 
lobby of face and ear and shoulder blade. We have been married forty years, at least four thousand times your pillow has been increased by our two hands. Four hundred thousand times a tall clock with the horse Westminster chimes has marked our common hour. How many more free calendars shall grace the kitchen door? I love you when you're standing on the lawn, peering at something in a tree. It's gone. It was so small. It might come back. All this voiced in a whisper softer than a kiss. I love you when you call me to admire a jet's pink trail above the sunset fire. I love you with your humming as you pack a suitcase or the farcical car sack with a round-trip zipper. And I love you most when with a pensive nod you greet her ghost and hold her first toy on your palm and look at a postcard from her found in a book. She might have been you, me, or some quaint blend. Nature chose me, so as to wrench and rend your heart and mind. At first we'd smile and say, All oh, little girls are plump. Or, Do you think they, the family oculist, will cure that slight squint in no time? And later, she'll be quite pretty, you know. And trying to assuage the swelling torment. That's the awkward age. She should be taking writing lessons, you would say. But your eyes and mine not meeting. She should play tennis or badminton. Less starch, more fruit. She may not be a beauty, but she's cute. I was no use. No use. <laughs> the prize is won, and French and history no doubt were fun. At Christmas parties, games were rough, no doubt. No one shy little guests might be left out. But let's be fair, while children of her age were cast as elves and fairies on a stage that she'd help paint for the school pantomime, my general girl appeared as Mother Time, a bent charwoman with slap pail and broom. And like a fool, I sobbed in the men's room. Another winter was scraped scooped away, and the tooth was what haunted our woods in May. Summer was power mowed, and autumn burned. Alas, the dingy signet never turned into a wood duck. <laughs> and again, your voice. But this is prejudice. You should rejoice that she is innocent. Why overstress the physical? She wants to look a mess. Virgins have written some resplendent books. Love making is not everything. Good looks are not that indispensable. And still, old Pan would call from every painted hill. And still the demon of our pity spoke. No lips would share the lipstick of her smoke. The telephone that rang before a ball, every two minutes in Sorosa Hall, 
for her would never ring. And with a great screeching of tires on gravel to the gate, out of the lacquered night, a white scarf bow would never come for her. She'd never go. A dream of gauze and jasmine to that dance. We sent her, though, to a chateau in France. And she returned in tears with new defeats, new miseries. On days when all the streets of College Town led to the game, she'd sit on the library steps and read or knit. Mostly alone she'd be, but with that nice frail roommate, now and then, and once or twice with a Korean boy who took my course. She had strange fears, strange fantasies, strange force of character, as when she spent three nights investigating certain sounds and lights in an old barn. She twisted words, pot, top, spider, redips, and powder was red wop. <laughs> she called you a didactic kid. She hardly ever smiled, and when she did, it was a sign of pain. She'd criticize ferociously our projects, and with eyes expressionless, sit on her tumbled bed, spreading her swollen feet, scratching her head with psoriatic fingernails and moan, murmuring dreadful words in monotone. She was my darling, difficult, morose, but still my darling. You remember those almost unruffled evenings when we played Mahjong? Or she tried on your furs, which made her almost fetching. And the mirrors smiled. The lights were merciful, the shadows mild. Sometimes I'd help her with a Latin text, or she'd be reading in her bedroom next to my fluorescent leer. And you would be in your own study, twice removed from me. And I would hear both voices now and then. Mother, what's gripping? What is what? Gripping. Pause. And your guarded scolium. And again, Mother, what's catonic? That too you'd explain, appending, Would you like a tangerine? No, yes, and what does sympaternal mean? You'd hesitate, and lustily I'd roar the answer from my desk through the closed door. It does not matter what it was she read. Some phony modern poem that was said in English lit to be a document. Engagery and compelling. What this meant, nobody cared. The point is that the three chambers, now bound by you and her and me, now form a triptych or three-act play in which portrayed events forever stay. I think she always nursed small mad hope.